South Dakota, and they have been holding it nearly a whole day. The Indians are in charge of the town. So how did it come to this? Warfare on the plains of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Occupation of Wounded Knee started on February 27, 1973, but the reasons that spurred this incident are steeped in the continuing unfair policies and broken treaties set forth by the United States government. Unfortunately, this was an inevitable outcome. But you see, the sad thing in America is that we don't exist in the 20th century. You have to specialize in Indian education of some sort, anthropology, history, and then f go and dig in the archives of wherever in order to find out anything about us in the 20th century. So there you have it. In 1889, the Supreme Court Justice, John Marshall Harlan, summarized the government's views concerning the condition of Native Americans in the United States. Quote, the Indian race is disappearing. In a hundred years, you will probably not find one anywhere. It is certain as fate that in the course of time, there be nobody on this North American continent but Anglo-Saxons. All other races are steadily going to the wall they are diminishing every year. Fortunately, this outcome did not come to fruition, but this persistent mentality perpetuates the continuing conditions of poverty, social injustice, poor education, alcoholism, suicide, unemployment, and high infant mortality rates that are all too common with reservation life. Dawes Act was a way to break up the whole tribal structure of Native American nations. Instead of saying you are a group of people, all of a sudden you are individual landowners, you are Americans. And so it was designed to break up community, to civilize people, uh, make us farmers, and to also break up our tribal structure. The Dawes Act advocated for Native Americans on the reservation to choose and implement a Western perspective of individual land ownership and wage labor. But this policy was in complete contrast to their traditions and tribal structure. The tribal land was divided into allotments for individual Indians, surplus sections allotted to many incoming white settlers. Through a long process, those who accepted allotments and lived separately from the tribe would be granted United States citizenship. Unfortunately, on many occasions, the best land was given to incoming white settlers. This is education that was promised us, and that was guaranteed us through the treaties. But it wasn't. It's was torture, brainwashing. They called us many different names. Savage, dumb. I got uh, beat for looking like an Indian, smelling like an Indian. <laughs> 
even speaking in then everything I did Starting at the end of the 19th century, the Bureau of Indian Affairs would pay states and private institutions to relocate and educate Native American children, even if the parents were opposed to the removal. It wasn't until the passing of the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 that Native Americans could stop the forced removal. In these schools, the children's names were changed. They were forced to speak only English and adopt Christianity. Children were severely punished if they did not comply, making Native Americans feel shame for just being Indian. Boarding schools were established in the 19th century, and the idea of this institution was to bring Native children away from their families and their communities for the purpose of cultural assimilation and to kind of really move away from their tribal backgrounds. The government forced Native people into boarding schools by coming into communities through their local law enforcement representatives and rounding up children and taking them to boarding schools. They beat us for speaking our own language. I could never understand that. I still maintain that anybody who speaks two languages is richer than a person who speaks only one. So why deny him his legal right to speak his own language? I used to wish I'd catch these white people on a reservation and catch them speaking English we'd have someone beat them. I remember a little boy, Reuben Red Bear, and he stood up, he was a little boy, but he stood up. He said, go ahead and beat me, big man. You enjoy being little kids because they speak their own language. You're not going to take it away from me. I'm going to speak it. You can beat me to death, but I'm going to keep it. Go ahead and beat me, big man. And he slapped that little boy, blood coming out of his nose and mouth. He said, go ahead and satisfy. Beat another little kid. Make his mouth bleed. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. I'm going to keep my language. Go ahead. Beat me. Their de-Indianization program, it failed. But it, it, the, the toll was, was devastating. It destroyed our family. It destroyed the relationship we had with our, with our mother. I, I could never regain that friendship, loveship relationship that I had with my mother. I, I, it wasn't there anymore. And that's what to this day, I keep thinking that, you know, damn this government, what it did to me and what it did to thousands of other children across this country. By 1933, Native Americans were in a deplorable state which paralleled much of America during the Great Depression. Benjamin Raphael, known as Lone Feather, and former administrator with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, recalls life on the Rosebud Reservation in the 1930s. Quote, We had the most sickening poverty that one could imagine. Tuberculosis was the killer of the Indians. The people on the Pine Ridge Reservation in the Ogala were eating their horses just to survive. Impoverishment was everywhere. The Indian Reorganization Act, dubbed the Indian New Deal, was enacted in 1934. It tried to reverse the effects of the Dawes Act and the national policy of forced assimilation. The two main goals of the IRA became economic independence and self-determination. But self-determination was never fully realized. It was becoming clear that the Dawes Act and the boarding schools were starving and depopulating communities and eradicating Native American culture. The IRA ended with mixed results, and many tribes never adopted it. But some benefits did come from the legislation. Native American educational reform became the long-lasting impact from the IRA. Boarding schools began closing, community schools were established, but the catch with the IRA was that the federal government granted aid to tribes that adopted it, which provided medical assistance, land, housing, and employment opportunities. Many tribes did not accept it, thinking rationally of past injustices, that this was just another empty promise from Washington, or worse, another institution to break up what little cohesion the tribes had left. 
It was called the Indian and White America. And the statistics that came out of the study was basically that Indians were living to be 44.5 years of age. That the average income on most reservations was between $1,500 and $2,000 a year. That unemployment on most reservations was as high as 80, 90 percent. The housing that I think at the time 40 percent of the American Indian housing didn't even have electricity nationally and some reservations was higher than that. Diné Nation in particular, Navajo. Um, the educational level of attainment for Indian students was 8.5 grades. So all these conditions were probably, and there was no question they were the worst conditions in terms of social measurement of any ethnic group in America. According to the 2010 U.S. Census, approximately 22% of our country's 5.2 million Native Americans live on tribal lands. Conditions have slowly improved, but reservations have been cited as comparable to third world conditions. The overall percentage of American Indians living below the federal poverty line is 28.2%. The disparity for American Indians living below the poverty line on reservations is even greater, reaching 38% to 63% in some areas. Many factors have attributed to these poor conditions, unemployment, housing, and health care are just a few. On some reservations, nearly 50% or more of the adult populations are unemployed. Economic opportunity amongst the reservation is bleak. Most work comes from the public sector, the tribal or federal governments. One legislator deplored the fact that there are 90,000 homeless or underhoused Indian families and that 30% of the Indian housing is overcrowded and less than 50% of it is connected to a public sewer. In addition, many Native Americans are living in substandard housing. About 40% of the on-reservation housing is considered inadequate. Health is another factor contributing to reservation life. According to the National Relief Charities on Native American Aid, quote, the average life expectancy for Native Americans has improved yet still trails that of other Americans by almost five years. About 55% of American Indians rely on Indian health care service for medical care, yet the Indian Health Care Improvement Act only meets about 60% of their health needs. Mary Bravebird recalls life on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. Reservations were places without hope where bodies and souls were being destroyed bit by bit. Schools left many of us almost illiterate. We are not taught any skills. The land was leased to white ranchers. Jobs were almost non-existent on the reservation, and outside the res, whites did not hire Indians if they could help it. Inherent sovereignty and authority on reservations are also limited. Indian tribes, as sovereign nations, should have inherent jurisdictional power on their lands but unfortunately, this is not the case. Most tribal governments have criminal jurisdiction over their people, but limited jurisdiction or ability to try non-Indian offenders unless Congress grants that power. This has led to countless violations and crimes committed by non-Indian offenders on reservations that have gone unpunished. Any positive outcomes provided by the IRA degraded with two major policies, the termination and relocation policies. The House Concurrent Resolution 108 passed in 1953, a federal policy which terminated all federal aid, services, and protections. After this, the federal government no longer recognized tribal government sovereignty within the nation, thus no longer dependence of the federal government resulting suspension of federal aid and protection.
After this, the government passed the Indian Relocation Act in 1956, which provided incentives for Native Americans to go into vocational training and seek jobs in urban centers. These policies returned to the assimilation ideology the IRA tried to steer away from, which pulled even more able-bodied Native Americans from their tribal lands. Larry Echohawk explains, quote, In the 1950s, the government wanted to make Indian people become more like mainstream society. By placing Indian people under the wink of state governments, doing away with their tribal governments, making them hold lands as other citizens of the United States holds theirs, and having their property subject to taxation, federal officials thought that assimilation would occur. That was not a new policy, but it received renewed vigor throughout the termination era. The government thought one way to solve the Indian problem was to relocate Indians from the reservation to the bigger cities. They couldn't kill the Indians anymore. That was out of fashion by the 50s. Uh, so they decided to experiment. They did a lot of experimenting with Indians. Relocation program was one such experiment. It was exciting, relocation. You know, you get to go to a big city and they'll help you find a job and uh, you'll get to, you know, see the rest of the country. Of course, you weren't forced to go on relocation, but they made it look good. Streets paved with gold. They put us in a real dumpy motel. And I was just sitting there thinking, I wonder what's going on at home. I could just see the rolling hills and the small, small town. They're all just moving and walking and going real fast. And nobody's stopping to look around. That's why we stayed in our apartments or stayed in our rooms. If you went and uh, applied for a job, you better not tell them you're Indian. You better tell them you're French or you're some Italian or some other nationality. You, you wouldn't get the job. One unforeseen but positive outcome of the termination and relocation policies was as more and more Native Americans were persuaded to move into metropolitan centers, connections and solidarity was occurring amongst the Native Americans in the cities across the nation. Individuals from a variety of tribal nations started setting up community centers, groups and organizations to build services to aid their communities. One of the most influential of these organizations was AIM, which was founded in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1968. At first, it was a grassroots effort to stop police brutality and racial crimes against Native Americans. George Mitchell, Clyde Bellancourt, and Dennis Banks co-founded the organization with other Native Americans. Eventually, the organization grew to include more than 40 chapters in the United States and Canada. AIM was influenced by the struggles of the African American Civil Rights Movement and used their models to protest the unfair treatment of Native Americans throughout the nation. They address such issues as American Indian sovereignty, treaty disputes, spirituality, leadership, police brutality, unemployment, and racial violence. In those days, there was a tremendous amount of racism, uh, especially in the border towns around the reservations. I mean, real racism, where Indians are practically invisible. There was towns you didn't drive through, didn't go through especially women, you didn't walk down the street of any border town by yourself because you'd be accosted by any white man that felt like it. AIM, joined with many other Native Americans, started organizing protests across the country. In 1969, they joined the occupation of Alcatraz, and in 1971, they helped with the protests at Mount Rushmore. But in 1972, AIM organized one of its largest protests along with the National Indian Brotherhood, the Native American Rights Fund, and the National Indian Council, which became known as the Trail of Broken Treaties. This was a cross-country, pan-tribal protest starting on the West Coast and ending in Washington, D.C. The march drew several hundred natives, and about 500 of the marchers occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs building, holding it from November 2nd to November 8th. A 20-point position paper focusing to re-establish the process of making treaties was written and given to the United States government. 
The 20 points were rejected by President Richard Nixon, but this did not crush their resolve, and the Trail of Broken Treaties brought together Native Americans from the West Coast to the East Coast. These protesters found inspiration in themselves and their culture. Being Indian was no longer a position of weakness, but a position of power and strength. This cohesion helped influence the next stage of protest the following year, that of Wounded Knee. In part two of this documentary, we will continue with the direct reasons for the occupation, the occupation itself, and its aftermath.